When we're talking about stresses, it's often useful to come up with a way to visually represent those and to define what we call the stress state. And we do this by using a stress element. Now, just real quick, you'll remember that sigma, our symbol for stress, is force per unit area. In SI units, that'll be megapascals. In BG, US customary units, that'll be PSI or KSI. I used MPA here instead of just pascals because usually when we're in the earth, we're dealing with really high pressures, right? Uh, that a single pascal is pretty much meaningless. So if we go in here and look at this, we have two types of stresses, and those are normal and shear stresses. Normal stresses specifically are the ones that we use for sigma. Shear are going to be represented by tau. And normal, as the name implies, act normal to a surface, right? You could draw a 90 degree angle. And shear stresses act parallel to the surface. So with this in mind, for any point that's just in the ground, right, if we say that this is the surface, for any point that's in the ground, we can fully define that stress state if we know the horizontal, the vertical, and the shear stress components acting on it. And when we say horizontal and vertical, we're of course speaking with reference to some coordinate axes that are of course always 90 degrees apart, x and y. x horizontal, y vertical is usually what we do. Okay, so let's say through some studies we found what these stresses are at some point in space. You can do this, you know, manually by getting pressure readings at a certain depth. Um, you can use literature that exists out there. I'm sure you can find stress distributions, some global map of stress distributions, or even regional maps. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole science behind that. But if you have these values, then you can fully define your stress element. These are little boxes. They should be squares. Sometimes our artistic abilities don't allow that. And then you'll have arrows representing your stresses in both the vertical and the horizontal directions. We would call this sigma y and this sigma x. I drew these with a positive sign convention, which is to say that we will define horizontal and vertical normal stresses as positive if they are in compression. And this is different from a lot of other fields, like if you're working with steel, which is much more frequently going to be in tension, you would call that positive. But because in the earth, pretty much everything is in compression in undisturbed conditions, it's a lot more useful for us to define positive in that way. For the shear stresses, we just draw them like this. And they're acting parallel to these surfaces. And we would call this tau xy and this tau yx. And then their counterparts, tau yx's is here, tau xy's is there. And the convention we use for this is we would say this is tau on the x-plane acting in the y direction. So the second letter here is most useful to me. I like to think of it as it's going in the y direction, right? It's going vertically. Um, and the convention we would use here is usually starting with this side. It's going clockwise. We'll call that positive. It's a lot less meaningful with shear stresses because unlike compression and tension where it's a mechanically significant differentiation to make because rocks fail much more readily in tension than they do in compression, the direction of the shear stress is pretty pretty unimportant. We're more focused with the magnitude if we're looking at rock slope failures or something like that. So we have all of these defined. And once we have this, we have what is called a fully defined stress state. And if we have that, then we can do a lot of things with it, namely rotate it in any direction we want. Right, so let's say we wanted to rotate the axes 45 degrees so that all of a sudden x was there and y was there. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, if these are not the principal stresses, the maximum and minimum stresses that can occur, which also happens when there's zero shear, then you might say, well, that's not the maximum stress they're going to be experiencing. We don't know if it's going to fail, right? Maybe you'd want to determine what that maximum stress is by transforming your system. A more common example I'll pull up right here, in fact. Let's just walk through it. Let's say we have a, a fault plane, right? Let's say we're somewhere in the surface. There's a fault cutting through here. We'll say that's the surface. We got our nice trees up there. Let's say that fault makes a 40 degree angle at the surface. And there's some point in here that we want to determine the stress state of. Well, you might say, okay, well, vertical and horizontal, right? X and Y. 
and maybe using those things you've determined a stress state, something like, right, just like before, it's all in compression, shear is still acting in these directions, and let's say you found sigma x to be 12 megapascals, sigma y to be 4 megapascals, and tau xy to be 3 MPa. With that, you can rotate them to pretty much any orientation you want and determine the stresses on them. And in this case, we would say, well, we want the stresses acting in the direction of that fault along that 40 degrees, right? So it's usually useful to have the angle with the horizontal. It doesn't matter, of course, but just by convention, we would do that. And in this case, just using simple geometry, we confirm that, yeah, that 40 degrees is with the horizontal at this point. And now I'm going to give some equations that we can use to find the stress at any point. And these, I'm not a huge fan of them. They're rooted in the Mohr's circle, which I will do a video on and show how these things are actually derived. But there are equations that they effectively boil down to, and you can use them without having to go through the whole process of developing a Mohr's circle. But I don't like just memorizing equations. It doesn't really show a full understanding of the subject. It just means you can pull an equation out and plug something in. Um, but here they are anyways. Sigma x prime, which is the rotated sigma for some value theta. It's a function of theta. It's going to be equal to sigma x cosine squared theta plus 2 tau xy sine theta cosine theta. A little bit more space here. And then the final term is plus sigma y sine squared theta. Similarly, we can find sigma y prime of theta. That's going to be sigma y at the rotated location. And that's going to be sigma x instead of cosine squared. We now have sine squared theta minus 2 tau xy sine theta cosine theta plus sigma y cosine squared theta. And finally, we can get the shear stress at this rotated location. We're finding tau x prime y prime. I should have mentioned that tau x y is equal in magnitude to tau y x. The directions will be different. You know, the exact plane they're acting on is different, but the magnitudes will always be the same. And that's going to be equal to 1 half sigma y minus sigma x sine 2 theta plus tau xy cosine 2 theta. So you could go in and plug these values in, you know, the 3 megapascals is going to be your tau, the 12 megapascals is going to be your sigma x, and the 4 is going to go to sigma y. You can plug all of those in. You can do that on your own if you need this to be confirmed, but I calculated this out in advance, in fact, and the numbers that you end up with are sigma of x prime is going to be 11.65 sigma y prime is going to be 4.35 and tau x prime y prime is going to be negative 3.42 and of course all of these are still megapascals you'll notice that since all of our stress values are in megapascals and the sines and cosines are just normalized unitless things. We don't have to do anything wonky with the values. If we were, for whatever reason, recorded and found values in with different units, we'd have to go in and, you know, do the whole unit conversion mess. But for simplicity, none of that. And if you're doing good data recording, you shouldn't have that to begin with. And now we can finally draw our new stress state. We can show that it has been rotated 40 degrees if we have a little bar there, maybe this new, that's our new face there. So if that was, so we have to think a little bit here. It's been rotated theta, which is equal to 40 degrees. So it was originally vertical. So this one is now, that was our original sigma x's are gonna go here, right? So it's gonna be the new one, 11.65. And that's going to correspond with one there. About the y, it's still in compression, notice, because these are both still positive. So we can be certain they're still in compression. We're going to have 4.35 up there. 
you'll notice that sigma x increased and sigma y decreased. They're moving further from the principal stresses. So maybe we went in the wrong direction or passed over it or something. I don't know. We'll have a discussion on how to find the principal stresses too in a, in a future video. But Now the final thing to take into account is the shear stresses. Originally we had them pointing in this direction, right? So instead now they're going to be going opposite, right? You have to note that because it is indeed negative. And that was 3.42. Like I said, the direction of the shear stress isn't super important. We're more concerned with the magnitude. But that is how you would define your stress state. And we can even label it. Let's say that was point P.